Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're all having an amazing day. I'm not on camera for this video because I am finishing off the photography for an all AMD build, plus a few other videos which will be incorporating AMD hardware, so normal service will resume shortly. The good news is, though, that we have lots of stories that we're going to be getting through today. Uh, the first one is just a quickie because we have a price and release date for the GTX 1660 Super, which is a super exciting graphics card. Haha. -ha. So the GPU is allegedly going to be launching on the 29th of October and is going to cost you the princely sum of 229 US dollars. So that's $10 more expensive than the vanilla GTX 1660, but is also going to run you $50 less than the GTX 1660 Ti. This is, to me, one of the most unexciting launches in recent memory, the 1660 Super. It is essentially just a 1660, albeit with faster clocked memory. It's using, of course, GDDR6 memory with a frequency of 14 gbps uh, so this is kind of a weird card because the super variant also has faster memory than the 1660 ti but the ti also has more cuda cores so it's definitely a really weird card it also makes me question what nvidia are going to be doing with the pricing of the uh, 1660 given it costs only ten dollars less than the 1660 Super. I wonder if the 1660 is going to have a price cut to, let's say, 190 US dollars at a guess, or if NVIDIA are just going to make it go end of line or, well, something entirely different. It's not to say that I have anything against the card's existence, I just don't think it's a particularly exciting launch. Next up, we have a couple of Intel pieces of news, the first of which concerns a rather interesting thing that has been discovered regarding Intel's drivers, and that is that it seems like they will support multiple GPUs with Intel XE. So, as a quick reminder, Intel XE does launch next year, and it will be Intel's discrete GPUs, yes, but that same architecture will also be found in future CPUs in the form of their iGPU. Intel XE is said to be uh, aiming at the mid-tier in terms of performance and we've seen a listing of up to 512 execution units leak thanks to a driver which means that given a clock frequency of around 1100-1200 megahertz you could certainly see those GPUs putting out around 9-ish teraflops to maybe 10 teraflops. Raja Kodori also hinted that there was something will be happening in June of 2020 and this does tally up to what one of my sources has told me, that that is indeed the release window for the graphics cards. So next year is going to be pretty big for Intel. An Intel employee also confirmed that the drivers that are being tweaked and tucked for XE are undergoing the biggest changes in Intel graphics since their inception. So that's also very telling of what's going on with the underlying architecture. But website Foronix.com has actually reported something rather interesting, and that is that a patch has been discovered which seems to indicate, well, the patch itself is just titled Supports Multiple GPUs. Now, multiple GPUs in computer graphics were pretty big for a number of years. Like, a lot of people were doing SLI, even the Voodoo 2 cards, of course, were capable of SLI, and uh, NVIDIA were heavily pushing it as well. But over the last couple of years, they've kind of fallen out of favour, and game developers haven't really been putting in SLI slash Crossfire support as much as they used to, which is definitely frustrating for people who did end up buying, let's say, two GTX 1080 ties or whatever, uh, because quite frequently the second card is basically doing bupkis. But this patch seems to indicate that multi-GPU uh, support will at least be there for Linux. So whether this is more widely adopted to Windows is questionable at best. Obviously, 
Vulkan is platform agnostic. It can be used uh, across a myriad of different devices, including Linux and Windows. So in theory, that could be the catalyst. Uh, and DirectX 12, of course, has explicit multi-adapter, which is something I covered extensively before DX12 launched. It also meant that you could run uh, different hardware from different vendors. So for the sake of argument, the, the 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 example they used actually before DX12 even launched was an Intel iGPU alongside an NVIDIA graphics card. I can't remember what the NVIDIA GPU was back then. But I did do a video on that and it's quite interesting. It, it definitely did improve performance, but obviously it just wasn't really pushed that much. However, Intel nudging this in the right direction could definitely be rather interesting. It's potentially possible this is not going to uh, extend to multiple GPUs. Maybe it could be just a little bit of extra oomph, like the iGPU of the uh, CPU kind of doing a little bit extra work, maybe doing some anti-aliasing or whatever. Uh, and there are obviously some other questions as well, like how much extra work would it be for developers, which is obviously one of the reasons at the moment it's not being incorporated, because... When you have DirectX 11, most of the work is obfuscated so that you don't really have to do as much work as a developer. And therefore, uh, companies can put out SLI profiles or Crossfire profiles or whatever. But with DirectX 12 or Vulkan, that has to be programmed. There's a lot more uh, pressure on the developer to do that. So that's one of the reasons it's fallen out of favor. I do wonder if Intel's One API is going to help resolve this, uh, which is obviously something they have been pushing recently. Uh, there's so many questions at the moment, I wouldn't be super duper excited that you'll be able to pick up two Intel XE GPUs and then stick them together and then it like runs flawlessly on Windows. I wouldn't be surprised if this is going to be relegated to potentially just uh, compute-based tasks on uh, Linux. Hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully it does work across a wider ecosystem, ecosystem excuse me, but yeah, I just, I'm just warning you probably don't get your hopes up super duper amounts right now. And now on to the second piece of Intel news for the day, and it concerns Intel's 10mm CPU plans. There is a report that we may see Ice Lake appear on the desktop after all. It was only a short time ago that website Hardware Lux were reporting that insi insiders excuse me, had told them that Intel were going to be skipping over 10nm for the desktop and just retain 14nm products up until 2021, and then eventually we would see Intel replace 14nm with 7nm, and that's actually something that one of my sources told me was going to be happening as well. But then Intel actually did something pretty unusual and actually commented on rumors and they stated that we continue to make great progress on 10NM and our current roadmap of 10NM products includes desktop, although they didn't actually state what type of processor that would be. So it could be low power variants, it could just be, let's say, HEDT and so on and so on. Although earlier this year, Raj Akhodori of Intel, although he, of course he does work at the graphics division of Intel, did say that there would be high performance uh, Intel 10nm chips, but once again he didn't give any time frame, he just said that they would be coming to the desktop. Anyway, fast forward to today, and there has been a rather interesting patch that has been discovered by Kamichi on Twitter, and this is on lkml.org. And this one's particularly interesting because these MSR files appear in the Linux kernel and have been signed off by an actual Intel software engineer. And the patches are for both Icelake D, D obviously meaning desktop, and also server-based Icelake X models as well. Now it's entirely possible that it's still not coming anytime soon. It's also entirely possible that these are just low power variants for the desktop. So for the sake of argument, 14nm could be the higher clocked models, which you would probably use if you're a power user. And then you would have the 10nm lower power draw, yes, but also lower clock frequency CPUs, which you would use for, let's say, NUCs, mini PCs, small form factor builds, so you kind of get my point. 
potentially even they would be socket compatible. So I'm just using an example here, maybe you would be able to put in an Ice Lake desktop CPU in your Z490 motherboard just for the sake of argument. And that is entirely possible, after all that same strategy is kind of similar to what they've been doing with the laptops. Then again, maybe Intel won't be doing that and we will actually have high performance 10nm processors. We definitely know that Intel are feeling a lot of pressure on the desktop side of things, uh, simply because AMD just keep piling on the pressure. Uh, the Ryzen 3000 series has obviously just been extremely well received, and it's actually prompted Intel to adopt hyperthreading, it looks like, with just about every one of their Comet Lake SKUs. So it's going to be very interesting to see how the next uh, couple of years in desktop processes anyway changes. And now on to the final piece of news for the day, and Eurogamer slash Digital Foundry have actually confirmed that the Gonzalo APU is indeed almost certainly the PlayStation 5 APU. During EGX 2019, they also confirmed that Gonzalo is the APU, Oberon is almost certainly the GPU, and Prospero is actually the codename of the console itself. And the reason that that is so important for us to know for certain, well, I say certain, obviously, assuming their sources are correct, and to be honest, given what I've been told regarding Oberon and the GPU, it's pretty darn likely that their sources are correct, that um, we now have a very good uh, insight into what the specifications of the PlayStation 5 actually are have a pretty good insight into what the specifications of the PlayStation 5 actually are, minus a few important factors. What we still don't know is the amount of memory on the consoles and also the clock frequency of the memory on the consoles. And we also, of course, don't know the number of compute units which is found on the GPU. What we do know, however, is that the CPU inside the PlayStation 5 is going to be running up to 3.2 gigahertz. Sony themselves have confirmed 8 cores, 16 threads, which is also uh, readable on the Gonzalo APU uh, code string that you can uh, find online. And we've seen that Oberon is running up to 2 gigahertz, although the Gonzalo leaks put the GPU of the PS5 to just 1.8 GHz. It's possible that 2 GHz is either a later production model or it could be a development kit or maybe something entirely different. I was also told in one of my leaks that the CPU inside the system is going to be essentially Zen 2 Plus, meaning it doesn't have any inherent Zen 3 features, but it just is a refined Zen 2. And it also has lower latency cache and a few other bits. You can check out my video, of course, on the channel if you want more information on that. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. And I'm going to let you all go. So take care of yourselves. Bye for now.